Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, April 16th, and this is the weekly market update. Anything that you hear or see in this podcast or video is not to be taken as investment advice. It's for informational purposes only. I'm not a registered financial advisor. You should not take investment advice from people on the internet. You should do your own due diligence. It's your money. It's your responsibility. Uh, before I get started this week, um, I just want to remind folks to uh, that if you enjoy these videos, share, like, comment, please. It helps the channel, helps us get the word out. Many people that want to help us um, expand our reach, ask how they can do it. That's the main way. Uh, you can also inquire in the show notes below. Uh, if you are interested in the themes that we talk about here and how we're positioning, how I'm positioning my funds, um, I put out a newsletter, the Actionable Intelligence Alert newsletter. It comes out once a month and you can get subscription information or methodology to subscribe in the show notes. I also have a Patreon channel where if you go and support me with a minimum of $5, I will give you the last I will give you a write-up, a sample of my writing, uh, which will include the last um, portfolio pick that we added. That's a one-shot deal. A lot of people get confused on that. They think they pay $5 a month and they get every pick. That's not how it works. It's a one-shot deal to introduce you to our writing and to encourage you to support us on Patreon. So if you're inclined to do that, those that information is in the show notes below. All right, let's get on with uh, this week's market wrap. So I'm going to put a link to this um, in the show notes. And this is uh, one of our friends. I forget this guy's name, but um, I'll put a link to this short video. This is one of um, Klaus Schwab's of the World Economic Forum, one of his thinkers, one of his acolytes, one of his... Um, uh, minions. And he's talking to Schwab in this video uh, about, you know, this new regime we're going to enter and how it's not going to be inclusive for everyone that most people are, you know, I don't really want to put it in his words, you have to watch, but basically, most people are going to end up being useless eaters. And what are we going to do with these useless people? I mean, that's what he says about you, you're a useless person, because technology We'll make all the jobs obsolete. So what will these people do? How will we deal with all of these useless people? You know, these people are very dangerous. I've said it before, you know, we're coming up on Easter and I want to, um, I want to wish everyone a happy Easter. Uh, the Western church celebrates it this Sunday, tomorrow and the Eastern church, which I'm part of celebrates it next Sunday, but um, is the celebration of the risen Christ. I'm not going to get into a sermon here, but what I will say is this, as I've said all along, and a lot of people don't like to hear this, but these people are pure evil. I mean, to refer to other human beings as useless eaters that we have to somehow figure out what we're going to do with them. You're not going to figure out anything. Look at this guy. This guy will never come to my house with a machine gun and put me against a wall. He will get other people to do that. These people are very dangerous because they think they're so smart. You know, if you really and they think they're so much better than everybody else. And, you know, you will own nothing and be happy. You will eat crickets, you know, all of this thing. They're going to tear down the world and rebuild it. Um, I, I put this up here because it juxtaposes against what we're celebrating, the risen Christ, the prospect of our salvation, redemption through uh, God and the living God on earth, Christ, uh, and then these evil people, okay? This is what we're battling against. This is the, the, the servant of the spirits of the air and the principalities that were talked about, okay? And these people are evil, and um, you need to understand that they are, you know, they brag about the fact that they have inculcated various governments, specifically in Canada, for example, with all of their WEF, I don't know, uh, you know, Hitler Youth uh, Training Program, whatever they called it. And... Um, you should watch this video, you know, quote here on the uh, tweet. This is Klaus Schwab's right hand guy talking about human beings are useless and need to be pacified by video games and drugs. I mean, these people are so strange. If you get into 
watching some of their stuff, it's almost cartoonish. They're going to, you know, this mind meld. They're part of that whole Ray Kurzweil, um, uh, you know, singularity when machines and human, and they're going to live forever and they're going to be immortal and they're going to rule over everything. These people are falling into the same trap that people have fallen into since the Tower of Babel. They want to be God. They are going to be gods here on earth. No, they're not. They're going to live 75 to 80 years. They're going to die. And upon their death, they're going to face judgment. That's my belief. So I'm going to leave the preaching. I'm just going to wish you a happy Easter. But you need to think about this because these people are trying to implement their program. Now, they're doing it in a cartoonish way. I don't think it's, you know, I don't think they're going to be successful. But these are the kind of people that we're dealing with. These are the kind of people that are trying to implement policies. These are the kind of people that are trying to influence what goes on. And you should take this into consideration. So I'll put a link to the video so you can actually watch what this bozo says and it's uh it's very scary it's dangerous if these people are ever able to implement their agenda um a lot of people are going to die now a lot of people are already saying well they are implementing their agenda look <clears throat> six billion seven billion people all making thousands of decisions each day even with all the technology we have trying to control every single person it's it's just not possible it's cartoonish it's it's these people actually believe the world is like, you know, one of these movies that they watched or something. And uh, I just don't buy it personally that they're going to be able to do that. But regardless, um, at some point, you know, we, um, we, uh, eternal vigilance is needed. These people are trying to implement this weird agenda of theirs. It's very strange and anti-human. It's anti-people and anti-human and it's, uh, it's evil. So I just wanted to bring up, you know, I don't know about you, but I don't consider myself useless. But, uh, you know, these people are kind of useless if you brought them into your job site or your factory or your shop or, you know, your construction site. You, you can even, this guy couldn't even get a broom job. OK, he just sits around and thinks, right, thinks up things. You know, we don't need any more thinkers. We need some doers, buddy. All right, so I want to get into some education here. I'm going to put an article to this. Uh, Smead Capital Management, I think they're out West Coast in Washington. Uh, value Investors, uh, they put out a weekly, well, I don't know if it's weekly, but they put out pretty consistent um, value type writings, shall we say. They're very Buffett orientated in that type of genre. But their articles are very good. And the article they had this week, which I'll put a link to it, talks about... Um, you know, return on equity and, that, you know, that you're buying a business and that over a long period of time, the returns that you get on stocks cannot be more than the stocks actually return. And they refer to this quote by Charlie Munger, which I'm going to read right now. Over the long term, it's hard for a stock to earn much better return than the business which underlie, underlies it earns. If the business earns 6% on capital over 40 years and you hold it for that 40 years, you're not going to make much different than that 6% return even if you originally buy it at a huge discount. Conversely, if a business earns 18% on capital over 20 or 30 years, even if you pay an expensive looking price, you'll end up with a fine result. And so I encourage you to look at the article. It talks about the purchase of the recent purchase by Buffett of Occidental Petroleum and how that fits in. It also talks about a historical narrative around when Buffett bought Coca-Cola and the fact that many people, you know, if you looked at just the Ben Benjamin Graham methodology that Buffett followed, it probably would have been considered a high price. But it gets into, you know, if, if a company is, is able to earn well above average returns on equity. See, this is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about return on equity. How many people listening to this know where return on equity is? How many people know how to value companies? Book value, for example. What I'm trying to tell you guys is this isn't just a chop shop where you come here or a, uh, you know, a bucket shop where I just give you names and you go buy them. You, you need to learn this stuff. You need to learn about investing. You need to learn about buying a business. When you buy a stock in a company, you're buying a portion of that business. So what does that business do? There was an interesting vignette. I don't have a link to it, but it was like a month ago on CNBC. They had some fund manager on there and they were going over his stocks that he bought or he owned and like four of his top stocks and they one of the ones stocks was up like 25 percent in two months or something i don't even remember what stock it was one of these software companies or something like that or some tech company that didn't have any earnings or revenue i don't know what it was and he couldn't even tell 
He said, well, we're really, we really like this stock because it's been up, you know, 30% in the last or 25% in the last two months. And so the interviewer said, well, what's the company do? And he was dumbfounded. He didn't know. He was just buying it because it went up. Now you can do that. That's momentum investing or speculation. Uh, I'm buying it because it's going up. It's on the new high list. It has positive momentum. So I'm buying it. I really don't care because technically it looks good. There are people that do that. I don't think they're successful long-term, but if you want to be a long-term build wealth type of guy, you know, we talk about it here. We want to buy cash flow. We want to buy re earnings, okay, that are going up. So, you know, we have two things we do here. We buy things that have above average growth over time, return on equity and cash and hold them for long periods of time and let it compound. That's one way. The other way is speculation by buying things that are bombed out and are going from terrible to less terrible, okay? That are shined up, shined up a little bit. And we, we know that. So I, I like talking about this because at some point, you know, coal stocks ain't gonna go up forever. Oil is eventually gonna roll over. Uh, okay, so you have to be able to be combining your speculations where you're, you know, getting these sh short term cyclical returns with a longer term investments in businesses, and how do you achieve the, the growth and the returns that these successful investors because you're buying parts of businesses that have above average returns on equity, above average cash flow, that type of thing. So I'm going to put a link to the article. These are the type of things that I follow. I mean, I don't think these people get followed enough. Um, they really do a good job on education. You can sit there for you know, a couple Sundays in the afternoon and just read a lot of those articles and get a pretty good education on value investing and overall successful investing. So uh, I, I will put a, 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 but this is true. I mean, how many people think about holding something for 20 or 30 or 40 years, okay? Or what were the returns on Coca-Cola for, Berkshire Hathaway when they were buying that company in the late 90s, right? In 97, 98, I think it was 99 when they were buying most of those shares. And at the time, many people were saying it was overvalued. But with the returns on equity it had with no debt, I mean, it was uh, it was a compounding machine. So anyhow, uh, remember, we are buying actual businesses. And that's how we have to analyze these. These aren't trading sardines. This is the trap that a lot of people fall into. They, you know, are just going to trade things. The, the next shiny object attracts them. And so, you know, we saw it last summer in uranium, right? You know, uranium's a speculation. It got way overbought. There was, a, you know, a lot of uh, movement into the company. Uh, a lot of action came in there, a lot of hot money. And then, you know, all the money that got in, got in. And then, it, you know, consolidated over the last six or eight months and people lost interest and it pulled back, you know, and that's how most people treat their money. And they just jump from hot sector to hot sector without ever analyzing why they're buying these things or never analyzing how do you compound wealth successfully over time. You know, one of the things I talked about when I started this channel, when I started my service was I took the, my, my returns were inconsistent. My ability to understand how wealth was created in buying businesses or in the stock market was negligible. And so what I did was study people that were successful in doing this. And Munger and uh, Buffett obviously are, are good people to study. So uh, it behooves you to uh, take some time to understand what you're doing if you wanna be successful long-term um, and not just be jumping from shiny object to shiny object. Okay. so. Um, Ger German wholesale price uh, year over year uh, increases. This is like going back at least to this particular chart to 70s. This is when we had the last inflationary bout in this time frame, and we're way above that, right? And this is very dangerous because uh, interest rates in Europe are at zero, basically. So you, <laughs> you, these are wholesale prices, right? This isn't even the retail. So the, these wholesalers need to mark up the re to retail. So you can expect you know, um, this to transfer into higher prices. You know, the suggestion that I have made is that this type of price inflation is going to lead to economic and political social turmoil. And we're starting to see it, right? And a lot of people were saying last year that it was transitory or that it's not that bad. And it's starting to stick, right? We're seeing, you know, this is parabolic. I've never, this is unbelievable. And, um, but especially in Germany, you know, Germany has a kind of in, embedded in their DNA to be anti-inflationary. 
And because of the experience they had of Weimar hyperinflation and what that led to, you know, the Weimar hyperinflation of the 20s led to the depression of the 30s and then the, obviously, um, the emergence of radical ideologies that uh, were brought in. That's what happens, right? When people become desperate, economically desperate, they are then open to it being influenced by demagogues. Uh, and that's what happens. So they, the Germans are, what I'm trying to tell you is this has knock on effects, right? Because Germany as being the bastion of the Euro has always been the anti-inflationary check on some of the Mediterranean countries like Spain, Portugal, Italy, uh, Greece that were a little bit more flagrant in wanting to spend money and not be, you know, have things under control. And now we see the Germans with uh, basically on the verge of hyperinflation here. Now, do I suggest we're going to have hyperinflation in Europe? I do not know. I do not think so. I think a lot of these things are going to be base effect. I think you're going to see a pullback. I don't think we're going to see 20% inflation rates in Germany ongoing. What I suggest, though, is that we are going to see a higher level of inflation, similar to what we saw in the 70s and early 80s. Um, and we're going to see these bouts like this. We're going to see these up and downs where you get this, uh, rates go up or it causes an issue, it drops back down, but you're still in that 5% range, right? You're still hanging around 5% or higher with these occasional dips and a lot of and a lot of bumpy rides, a lot of turbulence, right? A lot of up and down, you know, two years up, one year down, you know, one year up, two years down, that kind of thing, What you've seen here with very, you know, very drastic changes uh, in, in the, in, the um, in these inflation rates. And so the ECB, of course, is trapped like all the central banks in the West. This is why you have people like Klaus Schwab at the WEF, WEF calling for this new paradigm, this, you know, tear everything down and redo it because this is the problem, right? The West is totally in debt. The United States, the EU, Japan, you know, these, these countries have d debts that are not payable. They have pension liabilities and, um, uh, Medicare and Social Security uh, liabilities that are not payable, right? And so here's what we have here. You know, the ECB expects inflation to return below its 2% goal at the end of this year. So they're not raising rates and they're just expecting, well, don't worry about it because we expect the rate of inflation to go back to our, um, you know, this is their forecast. That doesn't really jive with this, you know, to get to this means this has to like crash immediately. So, um, and of course, you know, many people watching this and something I would suggest also, if you look at like John Williams, it's shadow stats, he's been doing work for 20 years where he calculates um, the inflation rate based on the previous way the government um, calculated it. And it's, if you do that, well, you know, they make changes, right? Because all of your social security and pensions and stuff like that, that the government pays are, tied to the inflation rate for cost of living. And so they want to minimize all that, right? Because it's destructive to this budgets. And um, so they've been trying to minimize uh, the way they've calculated, or should I say calculate inflation in such a way that it minimizes its true effect. And so the way John Williams looks at it, you know, if the current rate in the US is showing eight and a half percent, he actually says it's like 17 or 18 percent. And I think that that's true. Um, if you look at your cost of living, if you look at the prices um, and, uh, you know, a bottle of 12 ounce pot, uh, I mean, if you buy a Diet Coke at the store, one of those bottles, plastic bottles, is like $2.79. That's crazy, man. I remember when I was a kid, a bottle of pop was like a quarter, you know? So um, look at what the average vehicle costs, is houses cost, rent. I mean, it's just, I mean, if you make a pretty good salary or if you're wealthy, you know, this doesn't, it's inconvenient and you don't like it, but can you imagine people that are like, you know, lower middle class and working class poor, this is devastating to them. And so they're hoping that it's transitory. They're hoping that the base effects wear off and the inflation rate comes down, but I don't think it's going to, it's going to come down, you know, as I suggested here, but it's not going to go back to normal. It's not going to go back to one and a half or 2% by the end, you know, by the, you know, end of this the year. That's just crazy. I, I don't, I don't see that, you know, unless we have a economic uh, depression that just massively curtails demand, then prices would collapse. But I don't see that happening, you know, in the next, by the end of this year. 
And so this is the new, <laughs> this is the new uh, meme. If you, I mean, Democrats and liberals, they don't really do memes very well. They don't, they're not very good at some of this stuff. And so the new thing I heard Jen Psaki saying the other day, and um, I think the president repeated it, you know, this inflation that you're seeing now being a 40 year record that's devastating your, uh, you know, wealth and your standard of living. It's they're calling it the Putin price hike. It's the Putin price hike. And uh, what's interesting is that if you zero hedge through a little uh, thing here, well, that's interesting because the invasion was here. You already had the inflation, quite a bit of inflation between then. Uh, it's not going to help the situation. Obviously, it's going to exacerbate it because of the supply chain issues it creates because of the um, now disintegration of globalization, which led to decades of lower prices. But to suggest, as the Biden administration is, that they had no hand in this or they're not responsible, uh, they are. But ultimately, you know, it's not just Biden, Mr. Biden. He's going to be the unfortunate, uh, um, he's going to be the donkey that gets this hung on his neck. He's, uh, he's basically, his brain is fried. The other day, he, uh, I mean, he's in, he's dement, he has dementia and he's being used and they're going to hang a lot of this on him and then push him out. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, we'll have, I think one thing about the American people is they are very good people and sympathetic, even though he's a dastardly dude, even though he's a scumbag for the things he did uh, during his career. Um, he's a doddering old man that deserves sympathy at this point. They're going to hang everything on him and then push him out. That's what the, it's going to happen. But to suggest that you know, basically, this all comes from 50 years of abusing the monetary policy in the Federal Reserve. OK, that's who has most of the culpability here. But we have culpability as people, too, because we allowed it. People are not educated on the system, how it works. They don't want to know. They don't know how money's created. They don't know anything. It's done deliberately. But that doesn't that's not an excuse. That's an explanation. But it's not an excuse. OK, to sit back and let these people basically strip mine the wealth. That's what they do. These the way the banking system set up, the way the Federal Reserve is set up, the way the rules are made in Washington, D.C. by the lobbyists and their um, tools in Congress, uh, it's rigged against you and um, set up for them. And inflation is good for them because they own assets and assets go up in inflationary environments. When money is printed, as you know, financial assets go up. And most people don't hold financial assets, so they don't take part in the um, benefits of the inflation. They only see the negative prices and the um, effects of it, which are deleterious to their standard of living. But I think this is what they're, they're all like, what they do is they create, somebody thinks up this thing at marketing or they run it by some focus groups. I don't know how they do it, but, um, you know, that'll play with the uh, middle America coming to the election. Yeah, you know, the Putin price hikes. Uh, yeah, we'll blame it all on Putin. Okay, well. Good luck with that. Maybe it'll work. I don't know. But this just kind of shows you that prices were way up before the invasion, which are not going to be helpful because now you're moving from, like I said before, that unipolar globalist type world to a more multipolar um, and with less globalization, which means higher prices. Um, in the newsletter, this is something we need to pay attention to. OK, and I'm going to tell you why. What happens is, is with the success we've had in the newsletter, we have many stocks that are up hundreds of percent. There's a tendency to get recency bias. Well, tomorrow will be like today because today was like yesterday. And what I'm showing you here is a chart of commodity prices year over year in blue, percentage wise, right? Um, based on or juxtaposed against Chinese imports of commodities year over year into China in Rahimbi. And what we see here is that, you know, because China is such a large importer and user of commodities, it's the biggest importer of most commodities around the world. You see what's happening. It's um, basically the uh, imports are crashing. OK, you see that a large portion of the country is now locked down. Uh, you've seen some of the videos, I'm sure, in Shanghai. They've got everybody they got a city of 25 million people locked down. And that's not the only city. And so economic activity is screeching to a halt. Um, we've already seen riots breaking out because people are starving to death. Uh, and we, I don't know why they're doing this over Omicron. I don't know. Uh, I'm not going to get into all that. What I'm showing you is, is that the at least going back to 2004, um, when 
Chinese imports of commodities crash like this or go down, we have a tendency to see commodity prices go down, okay? Pretty drastically. If, so you have a situation here, look back to 2008, that's when you had the great financial crisis. You had a huge drop off in Chinese imports, they dropped and commodity prices dropped 50%, okay? In the space of a year. Now that was a great financial crisis. If you look at the um, Omicron thing, you know, we had that, uh, we were already in a downswing. And then, uh, but you know, what happens is the Chinese have a tendency to have these waves of inflation themselves where they pump money. So um, it's not helpful. It's something to watch, all right? We're getting well advanced. What I'm, the point I'm trying to make to you is we're already well advanced in the cyclical commodity uh, for this particular cycle. That doesn't, I still think we're having a decade long secular bull market in commodities. But like I showed you in that other chart with the German inflation, you're going to have periods where maybe two years, three years, where everything booms, then they raise rates, you have a deflationary scare, and then things can drop 20, 30, 50%. Then they turn the money pump back on and you get another cycle inside a secular long term cycle. So that when you look at this thing after 10 years, these things will be blips. But when you're experiencing them, uh, you can, um, you have to be nimble. You cannot sit here, you know, when this thing turns down like this, and there, it's usually with the lag, you have to be cognizant of this and you have to be willing to sell. We're getting close to that. Now, my indicators are starting to weaken. I'm not selling yet, but my indicators are starting to weaken. And uh, I'm not going to sit around here and wait for a 50% decrease. Okay. So, um, and that, that hurts some people's feelings, right? Well, this stuff is up. It's got to keep going. Don't be that guy. You can, we can always, you know, this has worked fairly well. Okay. Now we have other factors to consider, right? We have other countries that are up and coming like India. Um, they're taking up, but they can't take up all of the slack. Plus we have disruptions in supply chains because of not only COVID, but uh, which we still haven't recovered from, but we also have the disruptions now because of this whole war in Ukraine, right? And the disruptions because of the sanctions on Russia. So there's a lot of plates in the air. This isn't just one data point. Well, it's down, we need to sell right now. Um, in the past, that's worked perfectly because this was the main driver of commodity prices around the world. China was always the big dog on the commodity imports for the last 20 years. So this work, what I'm telling you is this is another signal that we're getting, okay, that we may be getting close to a cyclical top. We're not there yet, but like I said, some of my indicators are beginning to weaken now, okay? Um, and if you have, you know, that's going to hurt some people's feelings because they just get into the newsletter, we're all into these commodities, and I've got a lot of buys still on, but we may be starting to reverse that. The signals are starting to weaken for us. OK, so we need to be cognizant of that and we need to be thinking about these things. And that doesn't mean everything will go down. I mean, I think food is going to have a huge year the next couple of years. You know, grain prices, fertilizer, there's going to be food shortages. So that, you know, you can have contra, but like copper, oil. I mean, when you lock down basically the biggest industrial country in the world, China, which is basically happening, it's going to be a problem. Now, that will reverse at some point. But right now, um, you know, that could have an effect. We haven't seen it be reflected in prices, but um, it could happen. And like the thing, so what I'm tracking that tracks this uh, will be, um, is weakening. So um, something to consider. So this is the US winter wheat crop progress. This is basically year over year. So this is basically comparing the progress um, of good to excellent with last year. And you can see, that most of the main growing areas here are worse than last year. The progress of the crop of the winter wheat crop uh, percent good to excellent is actually you know down year over year in many. That's what this means. When you, it's not like percent good to excellent. It's saying the good to excellent criteria progress year over year. So we're saying you know in Nebraska for for example, which is here. This is Kansas, South Dakota. So in Nebraska the progress of winter wheat crop good to excellent is down 11% since last year. So this is not good, right? Um, because of the fact that, you know, this is what I suggested happens though. You know, you have, we had 10 years or so of outstanding um, 
weather and conditions for optimal crop growth. And now that could be reversing. I think it is reversing. We're seeing, you know, I talked about it last week. Um, this is going to be one of the biggest themes going into over the next year to 18 months is the lack of food in the world and the, what that's going to result in food price inflation, economic, social and political upheaval. And that's why I keep focusing on this. And, you know, we have the, the, the war, which is going to limit wheat exports um, and barley exports and sunflower oil, which is becoming short now. And then what happens, though, when these things happen, typically, unfortunately, it seems to compound on itself where one thing happens like the weather patterns are not conducive. You know, we get 10 years of good growth and then we go into a period where conditions are not that good. And then it's exacerbated the food shortages because of this war and other things, right? Political things that were uh, man-made, if you will. And that's the point I'm trying to make that, you know, we're already looking at poor crops uh, like in China, failed crops, uh, possibly uh, their grain crop being very weak. And then you exacerbate the supply, the buffer, the carryover stock that's there um, because of the um, conditions being caused by this conflict. And so here we go, right? Food prices push vulnerable to breaking point. North Africa faces a high potential. I and mean, we've been talking about this for months, guys. And you know, the mainstream media, Bloomberg here, finally writes an article. North Africa faces a high potential for civil unrest and political turmoil as global food costs rise more than 50% from mid-2020. And you read the uh, article down here, uh, rising food costs push Arab worlds vulnerable to breaking point. Ramadan for many in North Africa this year is a confrontation with economic reality and governments are under pressure over the cost of living. This is exactly what led to the Arab Spring, the economic turmoil. You know, one of the things I think the Europeans may not have considered is if we get into a situation because of the failed grain crops or the failure of Russia or Ukraine to meet export expectations in many of these countries like Egypt and Tunisia and Algeria that import all this wheat or grains from that, those regions, it doesn't happen this year. You know, I don't suspect these people are just going to sit there. You're going to see these people getting on boats and wanting to go over to Europe. You know, you have, um, when you have political turmoil, social turmoil, when you have people starving to death, they will get very desperate. And I mean, I'm not saying it will happen, but there's a possibility you could envision, you can make the case where people will just, you know, want to go to a place where they have a perception conditions are better uh, or, and, and, and so has Europe prepared themselves for an influx of refugees from, from Africa and North Africa and Middle East? I don't know, but we're to the breaking point. 50% increases in food prices doesn't really matter if you're in the Europe or the US, unless you're one of the working poor. It doesn't really affect me. I mean, the prices are crazy, but I can afford it, right? A lot of people can't afford it. And in these countries, where the incomes are so low to begin with and such a large portion of the, of the family income is devoted to um, buying food, a 50% increase puts you out of business, you're done. And uh, so this is gonna get worse, not better. It's good that the mainstream's picking it up though, right? Here we go, Lebanon is out of wheat. Um, and so it begins, Wall Street Silver. This guy's been putting a lot of good tweets up lately just uh, by the way. Um, Lebanon is out of wheat. Last shipment ruined by moisture. No currency reserves to buy more. Um, Lebanese news. There is no more wheat reserve in Lebanon and no information on when wheat will arrive from alternative sources other than Ukraine. The latest shipment that arrived from Ukraine was full of moisture and it was ruined. So this is, we're going to, unfortunately, you're going to see more of this, not less of it. And I'm not reporting this. I take no pleasure. I'm reporting you this. These are anecdotal, but it's building, right? The stories are building. Sri Lanka, Lebanon, Peru, um, violence breaking out in some of these places, riots, okay? People are not going to stand for it. And you have this, these morons at the WEF talking about, you know, people are useless, <coughs> useless eaters. You know, it doesn't, uh, uh, I mean, I hate to keep bringing that up, but, it, you know, it, it, it's, it's part and parcel, you know, possibly of, you know, what will be used as an excuse for governments to take more power, right? Um, so, because people, when they're starving, somebody needs to do something, somebody help me. And then the government steps in and says, we'll solve this, even though, quite, quite frankly, in many cases, they help create the exact conditions 
that people clamor to be relieved of. This is what bothers me and confounds me. So uh, oil prices, you know, we're looking at oil prices. We're watching inventory drawdowns. This is one of the things that's driving it. So like I said, you can't just look at that one chart that I showed of China um, without taking it into context and with all the other information. And so we have in India here, uh, India petrol sales are an all-time high. India's March fuel demand hits three-year high, petrol sales at all-time peak. It's a Reuters article. Um, India's March fuel demand hits three-year high. India fuel demand rose 4.2% to a three-year peak in March compared with the year-ago period. Um, so this is what I'm talking about. You know, the, some places are struggling, but other places have recovered. And we're now seeing record amounts of demand for uh, fuel. And um, so this is why we have to watch global returns. You know, one of the things Jim Rogers wrote in, I think, I'm trying to remember, it was a book about commodities. I can't, hot commodities, I think the book was called. This was written like 20 years ago. But one of the points he makes in his book about commodities and resources is even if um, the demand for a commodity, say, is going down, if the supply is dropping faster, the price can still go up. So this is all supply and demand and the marginal user or the marginal bit of supply determines the price for the, which we've talked about and explained before. So we have to really watch the data points, you know, to see not just one thing, but several, several items and look at it in, in, in holistically, not just one individual metric. Some people just focus on one individual metric and they don't get the big picture. So one of the things we look at for oil prices, or one of the main things is what is the inventories and our inventories drawings? So that means that we're not, you know, this is the period of time, which we've already entered, we're in right now, where we should be building inventories of oil. Why? Because you're coming into a period in the late spring and early and into the summer where oil demand will be at its highest because of all of the economic activity, the traveling for summer vacations, this type of thing, uh, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, specifically the US. And so um, if we're already seeing a period where we typically see inventories drawing or building and they're drawing, this is, this is bullish for the future. But, you know, we have a lot of things in play. Like I said, we have a Federal Reserve that has said it's going to, at least as jawboning, saying they're going to become tough on inflation. They're going to raise rates. They're going to try to uh, deal with, you know, um, lower economic demand and bring prices down. But are, can they really do that? Can they really raise price? Can they really raise rates to the point? If you have inflation at eight percent, and you're, you know, and if you raise uh, rates by half a point, it doesn't really do anything. You still have massively negative rates, and um, that is still inflationary. So, lots of lots of stuff going on. You can't just be buy buy and hold or buy and forget. It's not that type of market or situation. And so here we have a chart of the of energy versus S&P 500 relative price performance. We're at a period that is similar to that of the Great Depression, which you know we're at uh, two standard deviations from the average on the downside, or at least energy or S&P outperforming energy. We already talked about this before, it's turning. You know, We still have a long way to go just to get back to the mean, right? And we don't even, in these things, as you can see be, before, when you underperform, the mean for a long period of time usually revert to above the mean. Uh, so um, as this gap, I expect, you know, we'll probably see some combination of the S&P coming down and energy getting stronger because of the fundamentals we've talked about. Um, the S&P can come down a lot and energy go up a little bit and this can still uh, move higher. So these are more longer term trends. This isn't something you just trade for the next week or something like that. I'm not really into trading. I try to look for the longer term themes so I can put capital to work and then have uh, the ability. So I don't have to be making decisions 10 times a day sitting in front of a laptop. That's just, I've, I just don't know that many people that have been successful doing that. And so we look for more longer term trends and try to stick to that until it, until it plays out and then we move on. And, uh, but right now this is, uh, this is very bullish energy relative to uh, stocks in general. 
pretty positive. Uh, uh, one of the things I want to talk about here, um, this is the total horizontal well licenses issued by month in Alberta and Saskatchewan in Canada. Uh, taken together, this is a large portion of what they call the Western Canadian Sedimentary Basin, uh, specifically in Alberta, a large area that is very prolific for oil and gas production. And so what you see is total meters licensed in Alberta and Saskatchewan. And we are at a seven year record for meters licensed in March. Why am I telling you this? Why is this obscure data point being brought to your attention? Because we have recently in the newsletter uh, bought a couple of, might be buying some more Canadian um, small cap oil service uh, companies. And uh, as I suggested in previous uh, videos in the past, recent past, very bullish on oil field services, uh, not only offshore, but also in areas like this. And this is what leads to more activity, right? Licenses happen, people, why? Because you're at $100 a barrel plus, this is going to stimulate activity. Um, and this is what we're seeing. That doesn't mean every one of these wells gets drilled and there are still issues in the oil patch, right? Somebody emailed me or DM'd me and said, can you talk about um, pipe shortages? There's shortages of everything. There's shortages of sand. There's shortages of pipe. There's shortages of people. I mean, I talked about, uh, I think it was Trican or one of these uh, fracking companies. It took them, they wanted to bring another frack crew on because demand was sufficient. And it took them six months to scrounge up enough guys to put another crew on. Six months, okay? And we're seeing that already. We're seeing like uh, various pipe manufacturers um, being sold out uh, for drill pipe. You know, one of the major exporters of drill pipe uh, TNK is in Russia. Well, you're not going to be getting that 15% of that drill pipe and seamless pipe that was coming from TNK into the West because now we have sanctions. So um, you're going to have shortages, shortages of frac sand. You know, that was, like I said, this entire industry atrophied uh, for, for many years because there, the, the oil and gas sector was in a, in a virtual depression, if you will. And so a lot of companies just went away or were acquired. The companies that were going uh, still able to function shrunk their operations. And now when you have this deluge of capital coming at them, uh, you know, their, their industry can't ramp up fast enough for the demand. I suggest to you they will. I suggest eventually, you know, economics 101 prevails. They'll pay people enough. Things will loosen up. They'll find the stuff. They'll raise prices to get their margins up. That's our bet, right? And so this is positive for the companies that we have. We just bought in the last month or two. I think it was in March. A couple small cap companies uh, in uh, that are mostly focused in Canada. Uh, very small. You wouldn't even know if I mentioned them. But uh, we think that, the, the, you know, we think we still, you know, I've talked about this before. If you're bullish, you know, the oil field uh, OIH uh, has broken out already. It's probably needs to double from here just to, just to be where it has been in the past when oil has been at this level. You could just buy the ETF. But, you know, what we're trying to do in AIA is we're trying to find speculations that can, you know, turn a dollar into $10. Okay. A double is still good over the next couple of years, right? 18 months or whatever it's going to, whatever this rally looks like. Um, but, uh, you know, we're looking to, you know, make five and 10 baggers if we can. And so we take a little bit more risk with smaller companies. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with that. If you just want to buy, you know, an ETF and you'll still ride the wave, right? That's, that, that, that's a lot easier sometimes than trying to uh, analyze and get information on these, some of these small caps that are under $100 million in some cases, the sales. So, uh, you know, but we've seen when you do the analysis of the companies, what they did in previous cycles, I mean, these companies are uh, have extreme um, potential to the upside. So uh, nothing's guaranteed. That's why we have a little bit of diversification, but uh, wanted to bring this to your attention. This is very positive for these uh, Canadian oil field service companies. And so I will put this thread, this guy, All Things Ventured, wrote a pretty good th thread on tankers. I just want to give you the first... Uh, first tweet he made, I'll, I'll put a link to the treat, tweet thread. Very informative. I'm not convinced that we've turned the corner on the tankers yet, but this uh, guy made a pretty good case that uh, uh, things are bullish. 
He says tankers are the biggest beneficiary of changing trade patterns due to Russian sanctions, period, in capitals. A look into why tanker rates are surging this week and why this is just the beginning. So as we've talked about, you know, I can talk about this right now as an overall theme. Why? Because we are going, we're leaving the previous, you need to think about this from the perspective of we're leaving the previous 10, 20 years of your experience, which was globalization, offshoring to low cost, just-in-time inventory, which lowered consistently lowered costs over time and lowered prices over time, which created a deflationary environment, okay, which is now been shattered, okay? It was already being unwound. If you saw that during the Trump administration, it began to unwind some of this, but this recent situation um, with the sanctions on Russia and now this, you know, lining up of the countries in from, like I said, this unipolar uh, Atlanticist world that was controlled by the United States primarily with, uh, you know, the EU as one of its minions, uh, is now been shattered with the sanctions. And so, you know, the oil being produced, you know, was going to follow the cheapest oil on the cheapest route, the quickest we could get it. Well, that's been blown up now. You're not going to bring oil into Russian oil into Europe via pipeline. So they have to, they still have to use the same amount of oil, but then they have to now bring it from the Middle East on a tanker. You see what I'm saying? So the world as it was built and structured around that just in time, very efficient delivery methodologies has now went away that quick and now everything has to readjust, okay? And so this is why you're seeing diesel prices explode, right? The, uh, everything's all been shattered and mixed up. It started with COVID. It started under the Trump administration with uh, tax on China, tariffs. COVID blew the, started to blow this thing up. We haven't even recovered this. And now we're into this, you know, sanctions that have blown up trade even further. And so you're seeing this, you know, initial rise in rates. Is it sustainable longer term? I do not know. Um, obviously, economics does work if it's allowed to over time. But, uh, you know, uh, building a sufficient tankers if there's not enough or whatever the case may be, refineries or whatever you need to do to get or LNG terminals. We talked about this last week with um, the Europeans have said, well, we're just going to build all these LNG terminals. And OK, well, that's great. Um, but that takes more than a year, right? It takes several years. And then where do you, who's going to build the ships in anticipation of these uh, offload facilities? And then will there be sufficient production to supply the gasification units in the Australia, the United States and Qatar? You see, this all fits together. It's not something that just happens. So you have to sign the contracts for the LNG, then they have to sign for the supply to supply the liquid, uh, the liquefaction and then the gasification uh, places, the import export. This is all has to be lined out first. And that, that takes longer than a week or two. Yes, it can be expedited, but it still takes years. And then the procurement of the materials, the engineering, the design, that, you know, the permitting, all this stuff takes time. So um, when you just throw a grenade into the middle of the room, everything was like the machine was working pretty good. The machine of trade and globalist trade, globalism, and, you know, just in time inventory and all that, and you roll a grenade in the room and blow it up. Well, it's just, as, you know, you just don't open the door a minute later and everything's back to working normal. That's the kind of the point. So I'll put a link to this. Um, I think that uh, you'll find that it's uh, pretty interesting uh, and food for thought. I'm not sure, like I said, if we've turned it around, but we'll see. I'm still bullish over the next years, couple of years on tankers, but uh, we have got the timing wrong. I will admit that. It's been a laggard in the portfolio. All right, I think that's the last slide. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention, I uh, had been talking about um, publicly some of the stocks I talk about. One of them was um, CVR Partners, I believe. Uh, the symbol's UAN, nitrogen urea producer here in the US. I'm gonna put an article from Zero Hedge because now they're producing flat out into this, you know, best fertilizer pricing market that they've seen probably ever. And now the Union Pacific Railroads told them that they're going to have a hard time transporting the fertilizer they're producing to the areas where it's needed. It's unbelievable. It's just one thing after another. And I think, you know, what I've said before is that when it rains, it pours, right? Um, we already had these autumn conditions, autumn amounts of carryover for a lot of the crops. 
from year to year. And now we get into a situation where maybe the weather is going to get a little bit squirrely. You're not going to have the same yields. And then you exacerbate this by this fertilizer, not only pricing, but now actual supply issues because Union Pacific can't is limiting the amount of uh, private, you know, uh, tanker cars on and, and private cars uh, on its um, railroad. So it was a very interesting article. It just seems to be one thing after another. And this is all going to culminate, I think, in a big problem. Uh, I don't think it's by design. I just think, like I said, you just roll a grenade into the, this finely tuned machine and then shut the hood and it goes off. Well, the engine's now ruined. And uh, that engine being, you know, the efficiencies that were gained through globalization, through just-in-time inventory management, fine-tuning all this stuff. And it was very, that was a very precarious machine. It was very high-end, very precarious and running at a very, very high RPM, if you will. I'm using a car analogy here, obviously. And this thing, you know, you know, you take a wrench and throw it into the works, you know, it's not going to run right. So that's what we're starting to see. And we don't even know what all the knock-on effects are at this point. All right, guys, that's it for this week. Appreciate the support. Um, channel continues to grow. It's because of you guys. I appreciate it. Uh, anything you can do to like, share, comment, um, uh, especially the podcast listeners, whatever meth, um, method or form that you're listening to the song, whether it's Spotify, um, Apple, whatever, if you can leave comments or a rating, uh, positive, please, obviously, uh, but, uh, that's helpful to us and we appreciate it. All right, guys, we'll talk to you next week. Happy Easter and, uh, have a good weekend, rest of the weekend.